Take your Bibles, turn to 2 Chronicles 29. That was beautiful. Appreciate everybody that's pitched in with their talents and time and just for you being here. Uh, just, just for a minute, those of you who uh, do not attend here all the time, you're here for our homecoming, uh, maybe if you'd just like to stand just for a minute and just share a blessing that with Bethel Church, something that God has blessed your life or your family as a result of what God has done in this church. Could somebody do that? Go ahead. Amen. Share you guys. And uh, being us from a very different coach, uh, being able to uh, learn uh, a bit more of uh, our brothers. And uh, it's been a blessing. For me, I don't know my family yet. Amen. You have to come back. Your family got free candy today. You have to come back. <laughs> One more. Go ahead, Brian. Amen. Thank you, Brian, and, and all of you folks. I saw some of you um, already have your suitcases in your car. Uh, that's sad for me, for us, that we won't see you again for a while. But we know that in Christ, it's never goodbye. It's always see you later. Here, there, in the air, they say, and uh, look forward to the day. We're going to have communion today, and um, the message, I, I said last week, I started Second Chronicles 29, started talking about Hezekiah, and I told you last week that it may turn into a series, and I went back to look at the passage today, and what I saw coming up next in this story about Hezekiah um, it fits in perfectly, and God always knows how to do that. He does it better than I do. And uh, But one of these days, if you remember, Jesus at the Last Supper gave the bread, he gave the wine to his disciples, and he said, take ye, eat all of it, take ye, drink all of it. And he said, I won't partake until... I sit with you in my Father's kingdom and we drink this anew at his table. So one of these days, we're going to do this up there. Jesus has been waiting now 2,000 years to sit with his bride. 
I remember the day I got married to Lisa right here in this church. And I was, I was nervous all day. She was nervous. She almost didn't show up that kind of nervous. I'm glad she did. But Jesus has been waiting on us for 2,000 years. And what a table he has prepared for us. Amen? Amen. 2 Chronicles 29. And I always, there's, there's always an if to that. Because I've done this long enough. I've stood in this pulpit. I've pastored people long enough to know that there are people that I preach to in this room that I will more than likely not see in the kingdom of God. It happens. It happens. Let's, as the Bible says, faint not. Amen? Don't quit. Don't give up. Uh, the people who sent me that picture over there, the carving, they made that themselves. The hand coming down from heaven, holding on to my hand, is how it is. We're not holding on to God. God has held on to us all of these years. So let's remember uh, what Hezekiah went through. Hezekiah began to reign, verse 1, when he was 5 and 20 years old. He reigned 9 and 20 years. He was a young man in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, we preached this last Sunday, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And then I want you to notice what he did. Verse 4 on is going to be the point of the message, and I don't have a lot to say this morning, believe it or not. He brought in the priests and the Levites. Now, if you think about this, that's us. We are priests with God. I am not a priest in the sense that I'm the go-between between you and God. The Bible says we are all priests. And we are offering up spiritual sacrifices. We are the holy building of God, the temple of God, the house of God. And we offer ourselves up daily as a daily sacrifice. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ. I'm sacrificed daily. So listen to what Hezekiah said to us. Hezekiah would be Jesus. This is what he's doing for us. And he brought in the priests and the Levites, gathered them together into the east street, and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves, and sanctify thy house, hey, sanctify the house of the Lord, your, your God of your fathers. Carry forth... The filthiness out of where? The holy place. Number one, this. So number one, we don't sing rock and roll. We don't play highway to hell before the sermon. We don't worship statues in this place. We don't have them. We just have a cross. And that's it. Okay? But... Is it still possible for there to be filthiness? Oh, absolutely. Somebody, I just got a message from Michael. Someone's asking if it's okay to take communion at home while we do it here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Make sure it's not Mogan David. Or Muscatel or anything like that. It's got to be Welch's. Or great value. Make sure it's unleavened bread, not sandwich bread. Okay, you can make your own. But by all means, we believe that. But carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place, and I'll talk about that in a minute. For our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God, and have forsaken him, and have turned their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turn their backs. My dad had his own share of struggles. Things that he struggled with in his life. 
So when I see that, that's what I think of. But then I thought of my own self. I'm a father. And think of my own struggles. And then I think of my children. My daughters, my sons. And their struggles. And at some point, whatever daddy struggled with, you turn away from it and do better. Amen? And they've also shut up the doors of the porch, put out the lamps, and have not burned incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. Believe it or not, there's four things here. God made this message easy for me, and I'm going to mention four things that was done to the house of the Lord. And one of the reasons why we don't see revival in our churches, one of the reasons why we don't see revival in America is because our fathers did these things. And if we ever expect to see revival, if I ever expect to see revival, and the story of Hezekiah is about revival, Amen. and what God knew was coming down the road, if you knew that next week you would be in a coffin, would you live your life significantly different from here until that day? Of course you would, if you knew that. Well, let me tell you, I'm telling you that whether it's tomorrow or next week or next year or the next 10 years or whatever, you are going to lay in a casket one of these days short of the Lord appearing in the air. It is going to happen as sure as I'm standing here, as sure as you're sitting here today, that event is going to take place. Now, I already know the story of Hezekiah, and I know what happens, and I know how it turns out, and I know that God had put it in Hezekiah's mind, all of these things that he wanted done, God put that in his heart to do it. See, it's, it's, that's what it says. It was in his heart to do these things. It's in his heart. It wasn't just his brain saying, this makes sense. It was in his heart. This is what he believed. And God moved in him because God knew what was coming. And it was going to be bad. So I'm telling you that at the end of your life, you're going to be in a casket. And I'm telling you now that if God doesn't move in your life, you will not be ready for that day. You've heard me say, I believe that whatever evil spirit is working in our country right now, I guarantee you they're not done trying to destroy America. They're not done. And I'm not fearful of what Antipas do. By the way, they were burning Bibles yesterday. They took it up a notch. They, they, they said, we're trying to burn down the federal courthouse, trying to burn down a federal building. They should be arrested Amen. and imprisoned. That's sedition against the United States of America. But then, now they're burning Bibles. Because they say, well, that doesn't have anybody's attention. We're going to burn Bibles now. Number one, I hope they were NIVs. <laughs> but I don't know what they were. But I retweeted that yesterday, those very stories that were coming out. And I said, God is watching. Mark it down. They're not going to get away with it. Whether the president steps in, sends troops, whether the FBI comes in and does that or whatever. And by the way, it's not a crime to burn a Bible. Not in the eyes of the United States of America. But God has something to say about it and God's going to deal with it. And I would not want to be them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for our country. It's no wonder that Bibles are being burnt in our streets while people cheer because the love for the Bible the flame of that has gone out years ago out of most churches they're gonna preach every man's opinion they're gonna preach church doctrine they're gonna give man's philosophy man's wisdom but they're not gonna give the Word of God so what's the difference and Father, we know what's coming. 
We don't know exactly how it's going to be, when it's going to be. But Father, I fear for our nation and I fear for the people in it. Because judgment has been a long time coming to this country. And you said in your word that it will be as when you destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And Father, we don't look forward to that day. Because we're going to lose people that we know and people that we love and people that we care about. Help us, dear God, to reach out to them and save them. Help us, dear God, to plead with them before it's too late. But Father, you know what's coming and you're going to prepare the hearts of your people for when that day arrives. And that's what I believe. So Father, we need revival. I need revival. And I pray, dear God, that you would send it not just to me, not just to these people here, but all of those people on the other side of that camera, from here all the way over to Turkana, to Samburu, Australia, India, Canada, anywhere, Father, where my voice carries from this place, I pray, dear God, you would bring revival to your people. Because when judgment begins begins at the house of God. Open up our eyes to your word today, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. That verse from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, judgment must begin at the house of God, and that is exactly. Here's Hezekiah, the king. He's a political figure, but he knows that he can't get the politics of Jerusalem right until he gets the house of God right. First thing he does, he carried out the filthiness out of the house of God. Turn to Proverbs chapter 30. Look in your Bible. I want you to open this. There are several, you know me, I search words in the Bible. Several places in the Bible where God mentioned filthiness. Now, I don't have to tell you what all that could include. There's several lists in the Bible that will tell you what filthiness is. And I'm also not so naive as to pretend that it couldn't be any of us who would have that filthiness inside the house of God. I was watching this morning a video of a sheriff down in Florida arrested a church financial secretary. They said, we know she'd been doing this for the past 11 years, but we went and dug up the records for the past five years she has stolen over $700,000 from this church. And they have her locked up in prison right now. People gave their money. They trusted this woman. She cooked the books, hid it, stole over $700,000. They said, that's as far back as we went in five years, and that's what we tallied up. And I'm not so naive. And I, I know of a church. I know of a pastor. I can mention his name. It was Mike Hutzel. A church that he pastored had to fire their church secretary for the exact same reason. She had stolen over $40,000. You know what it was? It was in Oklahoma. And they have these, on these Indian reservations, what? Casinos. She had a gambling problem. She tried to take her life because she didn't want to deal with what she did. Her husband prevented it. Her husband said, I'll do everything I can to pay it back. But she went to jail. Not so naive as to know or think that there can't be filthiness even in this room today. Proverbs 30 verse 11. There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. That's the fifth commandment. Generation. That will curse their father. Be a curse to their mother. An embarrassment. With things that they did. There is a generation of parents who have to deal with the sins that are in their own children. They can't say, this is my son, I'm very proud of him. This is what he's done for God. This is what he's done for Jesus. They have to bail their children out of jail. It costs them money and lawyer's fees for what their children have done. They have to deal with their children being rebellious. There is a generation, and some of them go to church. 
There is a generation, listen to this, that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. See, I know it. I know what church people are capable of. And I'm talking about good church people. I know what they're capable of. I know the sins that still reside in our flesh and the desire to go out and sample the world and be part of the world and have part of the world in us. And the worst thing that you can do is think that it's everybody else and not you. That's the worst thing that you can do. People that are pure in their own eyes and yet they're not washed from their filthiness. I remember seeing that in some of the adults that I looked up to as a child. One man, I won't say the situation, but I knew him to be a church man. He was a man that sat on a board of a church in this town. I knew that. He was a man that was given responsibility in the church. I guess one of the pillars of the church. And yet I stood behind that man in the checkout line of a convenience store while he's buying his alcohol. And I went, man, I didn't know that. See, he didn't know me. He didn't know that I knew who he was. I guess he thought he was getting away with it. I don't know if he's still alive. I don't know if he still sits on a board. I don't know anything about him. But God let me see that one thing. And then God spoke to me, Mike. Don't let that be you. Don't let that be you. How lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords, their jaw teeth as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. If there's one thing that this church is going to be, and that is we are going to be responding to the needs of the poor. We would be wrong if we did anything else first. And I want to say I appreciate this church. And all of you folks online, I consider you as being part of that. I don't see who gives what. But I know often what comes in and I can tell you that God's people respond to the needs of the poor and for the preaching of the gospel and I just want to say thank you you didn't do it for praise you didn't do it for glory you didn't want your name there's no plaques here with people's names and what they've donated we don't do that your reward will, has already been written down and you will receive it in due time. Somebody say amen. Now, um, let me do this. Go back to 2 Chronicles 29. Imagine this. I'm skipping over part of my message. I want to get to this. There's four things here. God made this easy for me. 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 6. Our fathers have trespassed and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God and have forsaken Him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. Don't ever turn your back on church. Don't say this to my family. Don't ever turn your back on church. Parents, teach your children that. Don't turn your back on God. Don't turn your back. I talked to some young people yesterday. And I told them, you're about to enter into a time of life. I told them, tell their dad I said this. You're about to enter into a time of life where everything that your dad and your mom have taught you, everything that your pastors taught you, everything you've learned out of the Bible is going to be challenged. Is that true? You're going to enter into a world where maybe, maybe a boy you like, maybe a young man you like, and you're going to fall in love with him, but he's not going to be right with God. And your faith is going to be challenged then. 
You're going to have to decide, do I want Him or do I want Jesus? There's going to come a time when the friends that you hang out with or the college that you go to or the workplace where you have to work, the people are going to challenge what you were taught as a child. Was I right in telling them that? Then I said, your faith is going to be challenged then by your own flesh. And I said, don't turn your back on God. So then he said, verse 8, Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he hath delivered them to trouble, to astonish men, and to hissing, as you see with your eyes. Think about our nation right now. Think about what's going on right now. I thought this COVID thing would be over with. By July, it would be over, done with, and we wouldn't have to worry about it. He said, verse 9, For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. That's what's hard. Hard for me to deal with what I have to deal with, but then doubly hard to watch my own children end up in bondage. It's hard. And so what he says in verse 10, Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel. That is, that's what this is. When he said, This do in remembrance of me. This was the token of our covenant with God. Amen. Do you understand that? He said, This bread, this is the New Testament in my body. This cup, this is the New Testament in my blood. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that His fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before Him and to serve Him and that you minister unto Him and burn incense. Let me show you what all this is about. Four things. Number one, He mentioned that they had shut up the doors of the porch. Where's the porch at on this building? Where is it at? out here in the front, right? Where the front door is. When you shut up the doors of the porch, you've stopped invitation. When is the last time you invited someone to come into the doors of the porch? When's the last time you text somebody? Hey, come to church. Do you know why me and my sister are here today? Our neighbor invited my mother. That's how my mom started coming here. She got invited to this church. How many of you found out about me because someone sent you an email or someone gave you a DVD or somebody said, hey, look at this guy? Anybody? Look at here. All over the building. Someone opened up the doors of the porch to you, Will, and invited you. Check this guy out. He believes in UFOs. <laughs> Will might have said, well, he's white. Don't listen to that. Just don't worry about that. Watch him. And he watched. And he came in. Amen? Amen? So, if we want revival, do you want revival? Amen. Let's open up the doors of invitation. Somebody say amen. amen. Number two. He said, they put out the lamps. What is the lamp? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I will hide his word from my heart that I might not sin against God. They put out the lamps of inspiration. And I'm not talking about, well, I am. I'm talking about Bible inspiration. I believe this Bible's right. I believe God wrote this book. I believe God translated this book. I believe God preserved this book. Amen. So yes, we believe in Bible inspiration here at this church. Amen. That's why you're here. We're all using the same King James 1611 Bible, right? But what about the effect that the Word of God has had on you lately? Is there still 
inspiration going on in your life. Do you still read your Bible? Do you still think about your Bible? Do you still survey these verses and these words? Do you still study with the pure Bible search software? Do you go and look up a word? I want to see what God says about that in the Bible. Oh, wait a minute. Matt locks on. Hang on a second. Oh, I got to watch the days of our lives first. Then I'll read my Bible. No, 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 no. Get that Bible open and get some inspiration going in you. Somebody say amen. Maybe that's, maybe that's why there's no invitations because there's no inspiration. And y'all know me. Normally I don't choose words in a sermon that all end the same way. And I know some preachers that don't preach unless they preach that way. One guy I knew, he was head of the Free Will Baptist Domination. When he was talking to you, that's how he talked. And I'm just going, would you cut that out? But it just seemed right last night when I was putting it together. They put out their lamps of inspiration. And then they said... And that burn not incense. What does incense represent in the Bible? Prayer. Supplication. When's the last time you went down before God? Well, we know when Gary did it. God threw him out of his bed this morning. <laughs> Gary! Don't you and I have something that we need to talk about? Yes, God. Supplication. And this is what I learned about prayer. There's a book uh, written by, um, oh, I can't remember his name, John R. Rice, about prayer. And I was at a time in my life, man, I needed God to move. And my secretary laid a pile of books on my desk. It's from somebody that died in her family, so she brought these religious books to me. And so I'm sitting there mad at myself, mad at God, mad at the world. I, I thought i got to get my mind off this, so I started going through those books. And there was on the top of it was called Prayer, Asking and Receiving by John R. Rice. And as I began to go through this book, it looked to me like it had been written by Joyce Meyer. And I knew, di I knew different. But what God had to deal with me was, Mike, why don't you ask? Why don't you pray? Who told you, Mike, that what I said in the Word isn't really true for God's people? Who told you that John 15 isn't true? That if, if my Word will abide in you, you shall ask what you, what you will, and it shall be done unto you. That's what God said. Why have you stopped asking God for little things and for big things in your life? Why have you stopped giving supplication to the Lord and saying, God, will you help me? God, will you do this for me? And I've learned over the years to don't stop praying. Keep praying. There are things that I'm praying about currently that I'm not going to stop praying until I see God do it. Either God's going to do what I asked Him to do, or God's going to do something way better than I never even thought of to begin with. And God's going to do that for me, because God loves me. God is a prayer answering God. And if we want to see revival, why don't we get out on our faces before God and say, God, send me revival. Amen. And then, well, I feel like I'm preaching to preachers today. And th nor have they offered burnt offerings. And I had to think long time for a word to go with that one. Crucifixion. You know what that means? Sacrifice. You know what that is? Greater love hath no man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friends. As terrorizing as this statement might be, this is what I'd like to happen. I would like to be up here preaching my guts out and I pass out dead in front of everybody. That's how I want to go. I want to be doing something for God.